Number 10. Sonia Stahl. Early on the morning of October the 10th of 2021, Florida woman Sonia Stahl was sitting in the car while her friend confronted an ex-boyfriend about overdue child support payments at a house on 56th Street in Ocala. The friend, 22-year-old Alexa Newton, allegedly became violent with her ex, Timothy Mack, eventually trying to run him over with her car. 24-year-old Mack opened fire in the direction of the oncoming vehicle in what he claimed was an attempt to disable the engine and prevent it from colliding with him. However, one of the bullets struck Stahl in the chest, killing her. Mack was reportedly out on parole for a previous felony charge when he committed the shooting that inadvertently resulted in the death of an innocent bystander. He was arrested on charges of possession of a firearm by a felon and tampering with evidence. Newton was also taken into custody for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and battery. During the case's legal proceedings, prosecutors ultimately deemed Mack's claims of self-defense to be valid, and he thus wasn't charged in connection to Stahl's killing. Number 9. Christopher Scott Griffith A young Ohio mother was arrested on August the 31st of 2022 in connection to an innocent bystander's death outside the Spring Grove Village Kroger in Cincinnati. 24-year-old Tarvia Chapman had dropped Jawan Lunsford off at the grocery store and was waiting for him in the car when she began looking through his cell phone. She reportedly found what she considered to be inappropriate text messages Lunsford had exchanged with her sister. In a fit of rage, Chapman used her van to run her boyfriend over as he exited the store a short time later, also plowing into an uninvolved pedestrian in the process. Following the collision, the young woman got out and began raining punches down upon Lunsford, all while the couple's eight-month-old child sat unattended in the vehicle. The bystander Chapman struck was rushed to the hospital, where he ultimately passed away from his injuries. It was reported that 58-year-old Christopher Scott Griffith had been walking into the store with the assistance of a cane when Chapman's van suddenly hit him. The young woman was arrested and charged with several felonies, including two counts of felonious assault and one count of child endangering. A murder charge was also added upon Griffiths' death. While Chapman awaited her criminal trial, her infant child was taken into the custody of the Hamilton County Department of Job and Family Services. Number 8. Ashley McGill on the morning of August the 27th of 2022, Oregon woman Ashley McGill was waiting for the first bus of the day at the corner of Southeast Stark Street and 133rd Avenue in Portland when she was struck by a wayward street racer. Portland police gathered from eyewitnesses that a pair of cars had been racing down Stark Street at about 5.30 a.m. when one of them lost control and careened into the bus stop where the ill-fated bystander was sitting. A medical examination conducted in the incident's aftermath determined that McGill had likely died instantly due to the speed at which the vehicle had been traveling. As of the latest developments, the case was still actively under investigation and the police hadn't yet made any arrests. On September the 1st of 2022, dozens of family members and friends gathered at the crash site to commemorate the victim. Number seven. Veronique Allen. The police in Bogalusa, Louisiana, were alerted to a drive-by shooting committed in the 1400 block of Main Street at around midday on August 23rd of 2022. It was subsequently reported that an innocent bystander had been mistakenly gunned down in her living room after several bullets were fired into her home by a passing car. The victim, 50-year-old Veronique Allen, was a mother of four and grandmother of seven, who had become a fixture of the community as an entrepreneur and hairdresser. She'd reportedly been getting her hair done at her mother's Main Street house when a stray bullet fatally struck her in the head. As of recent updates on the matter, the authorities were still trying to ascertain the motive behind the shooting. Investigators did, however, identify the license plate number of the SUV involved in the drive-by, which was spotted traveling along Interstate 12 towards Lafayette later on the day of the incident. The suspects abandoned the vehicle and fled on foot and hadn't yet been identified as per the latest developments. Number 6. John Battle 
On March the 3rd of 2022, gunfire broke out near a Shell gas station along Covington Highway in DeKalb County, Georgia. Investigators later detailed how an argument had erupted between a group of people at the gas station who abruptly started shooting at each other. Caught in the crossfire was 28-year-old John Battle, a father who'd reportedly stopped to purchase some juice. Although he hadn't been involved in the initial dispute, Battle was struck by a bullet as he attempted to drive away from the chaos. The man's girlfriend and child were in the vehicle when it subsequently crashed, but they were said to have escaped with only minor injuries. Battle, meanwhile, succumbed to his gunshot wounds. Local police reviewed surveillance footage to identify the individuals involved in the fight that led to the innocent bystander's death. It was reported that two arrests had been made in connection to the fatal incident, including that of an unnamed 22-year-old who allegedly confessed to his involvement. Number 5. Margarita Brooks in August of 2019, Officer Ravinder Singh of the Arlington Police Department in Texas responded to a report of an unconscious woman lying in a grassy area near Collins Street and Lamar Boulevard. As the officer's body camera subsequently recorded, the woman's unrestrained dog charged towards him as he began calling out to her. Singh pulled out his service weapon and opened fire at the onrushing animal which was struck by at least one of the three bullets shot. Another round inadvertently struck the woman, identified as 30-year-old Margarita Brooks, in the chest. She was taken to a hospital but later died from her injuries. In the aftermath, Officer Singh faced heavy criticism for what was widely considered a reckless decision to brandish his firearm to neutralize Brooks's dog, a lab mix that reportedly weighed about 40 pounds. He resigned from the force amid an administrative investigation into his actions on the day of the shooting. In September of 2020, a Tarrant County grand jury chose to indict Singh on a charge of negligent homicide, to which he pleaded not guilty, claiming self-defense. In addition to the criminal charges, the former officer faced a $2 million federal civil rights lawsuit filed by the victim's family in the summer of 2021. Number 4. Lonnie Blue Jr. In March of 2016, Mississippi police made the public aware of a high-speed chase that had resulted in the death of an innocent bystander. According to Jackson Police Chief Lee Vance, the pursuit had been initiated by members of the Clinton Police Department after a shoplifting suspect, identified as Donnell Johnson, had fled from the authorities. The chase, which spanned 12 miles in total, eventually tore through West Jackson, prompting the city's police department to scramble in its attempt to contact its Clinton-based counterpart about the situation. In the end, Johnson plowed head-on into a vehicle being operated by Lonnie Blue Jr., who was ultimately pronounced dead at the scene. After being treated at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, Johnson was taken into custody on charges that included second-degree murder. In the wake of the incident, Chief Vance was critical of the Clinton Police Department and its handling of the situation, which he deemed reckless. In a press release, Vance stated, They came into our city on a chase we did not condone, nor did we participate in. We value life, not property. Number 3. Barry Fields Shortly after 5 p.m. on September the 18th of 2021, a shooting broke out on the 600 block of Astor Street in Norristown. Pennsylvania. Montgomery County authorities later described the incident as a Wild West shootout, which resulted in the death of 51-year-old Barry Fields. The latter hadn't been involved in the dispute that precipitated the outbreak of gunfire, but had reportedly been sitting on his front porch when the shooting erupted nearby. A stray bullet struck Fields in the head, killing him instantly. Shortly thereafter, investigators identified Brandon Darden, aged 25, and Joshua Aguadillo Jr., aged 20, as two of the individuals involved. Both men were charged with first-degree murder upon being taken into police custody. It was reported that 23-year-old Edwin Elah Cruz and 16-year-old Giovanni Elah were eventually arrested by Norristown police in connection to the incident as well. Darden ultimately had his murder charges dropped, but pleaded guilty to illegal possession of a firearm leading to a sentence of 5 to 10 years in state prison. Number 2. Amber Campbell A drive-by shooting in Hollywood 
claimed the life of Amber Campbell on the afternoon of August the 22nd of 2020. The incident occurred at about 1.30 p.m. after Campbell had crossed over to the other side of Fletcher Court to speak with a neighbor who was out walking his dogs. A car came screeching past and one of its occupants opened fire, killing both Campbell and her neighbor, 29-year-old Denzel Williams. Initial reports on the matter indicated that the latter had been the likely target of the shooting because he was set to testify as a witness in an upcoming criminal trial. Campbell, however, simply found herself in the wrong place at the wrong time. A doula by trade, she was survived by three children who were left without both of their parents, as Campbell's husband had succumbed to an undisclosed illness only four months earlier. Williams, described as a hard-working family man, reportedly left behind two children of his own. Number one, Gildardo Pareles Gracia. In the late evening hours of May the 1st of 2022, as the city of Anaheim's Cinco de Mayo Carnival at La Palma Park was wrapping up, a shooting erupted as crowds were leaving for the night. According to local police, a fight between a group of teens was what precipitated the gunfire, which left an innocent festival goer in critical condition. The victim, 36-year-old Gildardo Parales Gracian, was rushed to an Orange County hospital where he eventually succumbed to his injuries. Four teenagers were detained at the scene, including an unnamed 17-year-old who was believed to have been the shooter. The latter was arrested on suspicion of murder. Gracian had reportedly been attending the carnival with his friend, No Avia, and his family when he tragically got caught in the crossfire of a dispute in which he had absolutely no involvement. Number 9. Paul Templer In the 1990s, Paul Templer was leading a kayaking expedition down the Zambezi River near Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. 27-year-old Templer was operating a river tour business and for years had been taking customers on excursions. On the day that his life would be forever changed, Templer was accompanied by three apprentice guides and nearing the end of the tour. They were all in separate kayaks when they stumbled upon a group of hippos quietly wallowing in the shadows. An experienced guide, Templer knew how dangerous they could be and steered his group away from them. Suddenly, he saw one of the guides being flung into the air and then splashing into the river. Templer paddled back to help him, but before he could reach him, found himself head first and up to his waist inside the throat of an enraged hippo bull. He could feel enormous pressure on his body and fruitlessly struggled to escape. He was only able to do so after the beast loosened the grip of its colossal jaws. A second guide risked his life by paddling towards Templer and managed to bring him to shore. It was there that he discovered one of his arms had been stripped of the flesh from the elbow down and crushed to a pulp from the elbow up. Templar survived the encounter, but his left arm was beyond saving and required amputation. His road to recovery was long and he spent months in a deep depression after having to take a desk job. However, within two years of the attack, Templar was back on the Zambezi, leading an expedition and using a specially adapted kayak paddle to navigate the waters. Number eight, April Morton. In December of 2019, an experienced Tennessee kayaker died in an accident on Laurel River in North Carolina. 31-year-old April Morton was considered an expert paddler, part of the Chota Canoe Club in Knoxville. An emergency call was placed at about 1.45 p.m. and paramedics arrived to find Morton in critical condition about two miles from the trailhead used to access the popular Whitewater River. She had reportedly gotten hung underneath a tree in the water, which she didn't see going into the rapids. First responders took over resuscitation efforts from Morton's friends and a doctor who happened to be kayaking nearby and had rushed to her aid. Morton was transported to a hospital in Asheville, where she was pronounced dead. Number seven, Scott Puckett and Alex Ecker. In 2019, spring flooding claimed the lives of two kayakers after they'd set off on a swollen creek in Missouri. Scott Puckett, Alex Ecker and Justin Seal had gone paddling near the small town of Walnut Shade. The men were swept over a low water bridge and caught in a hydraulic, which is water flowing on top of itself that creates a washing machine effect, which is difficult to escape. None of the men were wearing life vests when their kayaks capsized. 35-year-old Puckett and Eckern, aged 23, were taken away by the raging waters. Seal escaped by climbing a steep bank and went to get help. The victims' bodies were recovered in the days that followed. 
after the water level had gone down. Number 6. Thomas Christopher Lloyd In September of 2016, student Christopher Lloyd drowned after his kayak capsized on a fast-flowing stretch of the River Glaslyn in Gwynedd, Wales. 24-year-old Lloyd, who studied environmental management at Bangor University, and his friend, Jack Swan, did several laps on a section of the river that measured close to 1,000 feet. On the tragic last turn, Lloyd's kayak flipped and he was unable to right it. He collided with several massive boulders as Swan struggled to reach him. Once he'd finally gotten within range, Lloyd was already face down in the water unresponsive. Swan tried attaching a line to his body but couldn't dislodge him as his foot was stuck in the rocks. Firefighters, police and mountain rescuers arrived at the scene but the conditions were deemed too dangerous for retrieving the body. A coroner would later report drowning as the official cause of death. Number 5. Thomas Warden In early 2020, a British tourist died as he and his girlfriend were trying to kayak across a lake in Argentina. 34-year-old Thomas Warden and Charlotte Inman were at the foothills of the Andes and had set off from an island called Isla Victoria on Nahuel Huapi, a glacial lake with crystal clear waters. They were trying to reach the famous town of Bariloque. The authorities had recently closed the lake to nautical activities because of the weather conditions. While out on the water, the couple faced powerful winds of up to 50 miles per hour. Both their kayaks were overturned, but while Inman was able to get back into hers, Warden drifted away. She desperately paddled back to shore, where she went searching for help. She was placed into a vehicle with heating and given hot beverages, as well as a change of clothes. Inman was constantly asking if the authorities were looking for her boyfriend while repeating, in a state of shock. What a bad decision! Warden's body was later found, six miles off Bariloque, and nearly 20 miles from where he disappeared. Number 4. Rod Johnston In 2021, a British man died while paddling his kayak off a tourist beach near Cape Town, South Africa. 46-year-old Rod Johnston, a banker who had a seaside holiday home in the area, had set off in calm conditions, but the weather abruptly changed. Johnston was forced to contend with high winds and strong offshore waves. He had been lent a sleek surf ski by a friend who'd visited him at Christmas, but such watercrafts are not meant to be used by amateurs, particularly in rough weather conditions. It's believed that he was dragged to open sea where his kayak capsized. A rescue operation was launched involving several vessels and a helicopter. Shortly after dawn, his kayak was spotted floating adrift five miles out to sea. Johnston's lifeless body was still attached to it by a short safety line. A rescue diver was dropped from the helicopter and secured his body which was then airlifted from the rough seas. Johnston was survived by his wife Debbie and a 24-year-old son. Number 3. Mary Neal In 1999, orthopedic surgeon Mary Neal, originally from Wyoming, was kayaking on the Fue River in Chile. She went over a waterfall and got trapped at its base. Neil struggled to break free from the bedrock but soon realized her efforts were fruitless against the volume and sheer force of the water. She spent almost 12 minutes submerged, a time during which the woman could feel her bones breaking before ultimately accepting that she was going to die, interpreting it as God's will. Neil's companions then extracted her from the water. One of them, an EMT, remembered that she was blue, waxy, no heartbeat, no breathing, cold to the touch, dead. After going without oxygen for 24 minutes, Neil's chances of survival were close to zero. Miraculously, she then recovered without suffering any brain damage. Upon regaining consciousness, Neil would tell her companions that she'd been to heaven. She described feeling at peace as her spirit was peeled away from her body and that she'd converse with entities of unknown origins. By her account, she watched from above as the other kayakers were performing CPR on her. She was ultimately told that she had to go back and share her story. The group was far from help and Neil had suffered multiple broken bones. However, they were surprised to find an ambulance parked on a dirt road nearby. Neil eventually made a full recovery, but her ordeal wasn't over. Before being sent back in her body, she'd allegedly been forewarned that her oldest son, Willie, was going to die young. Ten years after Neil's kayaking accident, and as she finished her memoir, 20-year-old Willie was killed in a car crash by a distracted driver. Neil's story was featured in the Netflix documentary series, Surviving Death. Number 2. Jeremy Worthy In May of 2020, harrowing footage out of New South Wales, Australia, showed a kayaker's final moments as he battled the swell near Batemans Bay 
43-year-old Jeremy Worthy had gone out to fish, but then got exhausted while pushing against the tide. In an effort to get back to Snapper Island, he uploaded a live video to Facebook at around 12.21, which has been interpreted as a last plea for help, with the man detailing the perils of his situation as the waves were pushing him where he didn't want to go. He added that he didn't want to be an embarrassed fool by calling Marine Rescue. Just nine minutes after he'd posted a video, a member of the public found his empty kayak and notified the authorities. A rescue officer retrieved his body between Square Head and Sandy Place. CPR was performed on Worthy, but he was eventually pronounced dead at the scene. Number 1. Kayak Killer On April the 19th of 2015, Angelica Grasswald and fiancé Vincent Viafore headed out across the Hudson River towards Bannerman's Island. The water was cold, about 48 degrees, and the forecast called for rain, but they paddled out regardless. On the return trip several hours later, they encountered turbulent waves. Viafore, who wasn't wearing a life vest or a wetsuit in addition to using the improper kayak for the water type, told Grasswald that it would be the adventure of a lifetime. Those would end up being his last words to her. 46-year-old Viafore's kayak overturned and he was carried out by the current to ultimately drown in the rough waters. Grasswald placed a 911 call in which the strong winds were audible, as were the waves battering her kayak. Claiming she was unable to reach Via Forte, she capsized as well but was wearing a life vest and was subsequently rescued. Later, in an 11-hour police interrogation, the 35-year-old woman would tell officers that Via Forte was controlling, constantly pushing her into a lifestyle that she didn't want and admitted that she wanted him to die. Yet she denied killing him. According to the police, she'd confessed to removing a draining plug from his kayak and a connector ring from his paddle, but that conversation wasn't recorded. Graswold was arrested and faced life in prison for second-degree murder. Even though some media outlets had labeled her as the kayak killer, Graswold always maintained her innocence, claiming she hadn't intended to kill her fiancé. She ultimately pled guilty to the lesser charge of negligent homicide, for which she spent just over two and a half years in prison. Number 8. Judith Garrett In September of 2014, 29-year-old Judith Garrett of Northumberland, England, was attending a cycling race in North Wales when the accident occurred. She was there in support of her boyfriend, a competitor in the race, when a cyclist lost control at the bottom of the downhill course, sending his bike hurtling into the crowd. It struck Garrett and launched her back into a tree. She suffered major head injuries as a result of the impact and had to be airlifted to a nearby hospital, where she passed away the following day. Concerns were subsequently raised regarding the safety measures taken by the event's organizers and race marshals on the day of the competition. The steep course sent cyclists racing past crowds at speeds of up to 40 miles per hour. There were separation shoulders installed along the route to ensure attendees didn't stand too close to the raceway. Following Garrett's death, some questioned whether the shoulders were wide enough. A marshal present at the scene of the accident, the race organizer and the British Cycling Federation were all brought to court on health and safety charges. They were, however, each found not guilty of any wrongdoing. Number 7. Jonathan Denver 24-year-old Jonathan Denver of Fort Bragg, Northern California, attended a game between the Los Angeles Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants at AT&T Park on September the 25th of 2013. He was there with his brother and his father, a Dodgers security guard, supporting the LA club in San Francisco's home stadium. The trio left early, as it had become apparent that a Giants win was imminent, and they decided to go to a bar downtown. At roughly 11.30 that night, they left the bar and got involved in a dispute with a group of people leaving a nightclub. Denver had heckled the clubbers because they were wearing San Francisco Giants attire, and an argument broke out with Michael Montgomery, age 21. After a loud but relatively innocuous shouted match, tensions between the two parties had started to die down. The fight was soon rekindled, however. Authorities were unsure of who'd instigated the second spat, but it ultimately escalated into a physical altercation. Denver and his brother attacked Montgomery, at some point reportedly hitting him over the head with a cheer. In the ensuing scuffle, Denver was fatally stabbed. In the investigation that followed, Montgomery was arrested on suspicion of murdering Denver that night. However, San Francisco District Attorney George Gaskin eventually cleared him of all charges, concluding that there wasn't definitive evidence to disprove Montgomery's assertion that he was acting in self-defense when he'd stabbed Denver. Number 6. 
the Bradford City Stadium fire. During an English League third division football match between Bradford City and Lincoln City on May the 11th of 1985, a careless spectator attempted to put out his cigarette on the floor of the bleachers, but it slipped through a small crack in the stands. He and his son noticed that smoke had begun to rise from the area it had fallen into, so they poured coffee down there in an attempt to extinguish any potential flame. The plume of smoke only grew larger, so they left to notify a stadium steward. There was a buildup of garbage sitting below the stands which had caught fire when the cigarette fell down there. By the time the man and his son returned with the attendant, a fire had already engulfed their section of the stands. Due to uncharacteristically windy conditions that day, the blaze engulfed the entire stadium within four minutes. Large masses of spectators attempted to flee the arena, but many of the exit doors and turnstiles had been locked upon the start of the match. A number of fans were burned alive as they attempted to break through the locked exits. Those in the crowd who'd rushed the field successfully escaped the fire, while many others were trapped in their seats. The fire brigade raced to the stadium, arriving four minutes after being notified of the situation. Rescuers struggled to get to the source of the fire, and it took many hours for them to extinguish the flames and retrieve all of the bodies. The fire resulted in 56 deaths and 265 non-fatal injuries. The incident led to widespread safety reforms and UK stadiums were no longer allowed to use wooden grandstands. A total sum of roughly £20 million was awarded in court to 154 people injured or bereaved by the fire. The identity of the man who initially started the deadly blaze has never officially been confirmed. Number 5. The Spearman Parachuting Accident On October the 4th of 1996, a freak accident took the life of a woman at a high school football game in Spearman, Texas. As part of the pre-game ceremonies, a pair of parachutists planned to jump from an airplane and land at midfield with the game ball in hand. Unexpected winds sent one of them off course and they lost control of the descent as they drew nearer to the field. Two additional crew members, a husband and wife duo, stood at ground level to catch the others in the event that one of them required assistance with their landing. Unfortunately, the ground crew wasn't paying attention to the wayward parachutists, who subsequently landed directly on top of them. The woman was left unconscious on the sideline for several minutes while a medical professional attempted to resuscitate her. She was subsequently taken to a hospital but died later that night. Her husband suffered a broken arm but was otherwise outside of any real danger. Number 4. The Ellis Park Stadium Disaster Ellis Park Stadium in Johannesburg, South Africa, was the location of a highly anticipated soccer match between the Kaiser Chiefs and the Orlando Pirates, a storied rivalry within the sport known to draw massive crowds. On April the 11th of 2001, an unprecedented number of spectators made desperate attempts to gain access to the stadium. While the arena's crowd capacity maxed out at 60,000, there were reports that as many as 120,000 people pushed their way inside that day. As a result of the uncontrollable flow of fans, many found themselves trapped beneath the stampede of people rushing to get inside in an attempt to quell the crowd. Security guards fired tear gas canisters into them, but it only made matters worse as panic ensued. The crush resulted in a multitude of injuries and claimed the lives of 43 people. The match was stopped after stadium officials received news of the extensive casualties. All spectators were then sent away so that the victims could be identified and medical attention could be given to those wounded. In the aftermath of the tragic event, authorities discovered that some of the stadium attendants had been bribed to let in more people than was allowed. The disaster was the deadliest sporting accident in South African history, surpassing a 1991 incident that resulted in 42 deaths and a match between the same two teams. Number 3. Justin Hayes and Ronald Lee Homer On May the 21st of 2008, a baseball spectator at Turner Field in Atlanta, Georgia fell roughly 60 feet from his seat in the stadium's upper deck, plummeting to the ground-level concourse positioned behind home plate. Justin Hayes, age 25, was attended a game between the hometown Atlanta Braves and the visiting New York Mets when his fatal fall occurred. He had reportedly attempted to slide down the banister of a stairwell when he lost control and went over the edge of the upper deck safety railing. He suffered major injuries to his head as a result of the fall in. Although he was transported to Grady Memorial Hospital, there was nothing that could be done to save his life. The police believed alcohol had been a factor in the accident. An eerily similar incident occurred just a few years later, when 29-year-old Ronald Lee Homer fell to his death from Turner Field's upper deck 
On August the 12th of 2013, Homer's autopsy revealed that his blood alcohol level was roughly twice the legal limit at the time of the fall. Number 2. Shannon Stone During a Major League Baseball game at Rangers Ballpark in Arlington, Texas, a 39-year-old firefighter died in front of his young son. Brownwood resident Shannon Stone had taken his son to a game between the Texas Rangers and the Oakland Athletics on July the 7th of 2011. Rangers' outfielder Josh Hamilton threw a baseball up to Stone in the stands as a souvenir. As he reached out to catch it, Stone leaned over the railing that separates the bleachers from the field. He lost his balance and fell. The firefighter dropped roughly 20 feet and landed on the concrete below. While he survived the initial impact, his condition deteriorated rapidly as he was being transported to a Fort Worth hospital. Within an hour of the fall, he was pronounced dead. Hamilton was distraught upon hearing the news of Stone's passing. The locker rooms for both teams were closed off to reporters after the game, as many of the players were reportedly shaken up by the incident. Number 1. Sabrina Patti 39-year-old Sabrina Patti of Tampa, Florida, an elementary school teacher and mother of two, wanted to do something special for her hockey-loving family. The woman and her two sons were die-hard supporters of the Tampa Bay Lightning, so she and her husband brought them to their first professional hockey game on April the 14th of 2018. It was a playoff match between the Lightning and the New Jersey Devils at the Amelie Arena in Tampa. Professional hockey stadiums have safety nets installed in order to catch the puck should it careen into the stands. The Patties were sitting in the area where the safety net comes to an end and there are no protective implements in place. During the game, the puck was launched over the net and into the stands, striking Patty directly in the face. She was taken to a medical area within the facility in order for her injuries to be examined and later transported to Tampa General Hospital. She experienced numbness in the left side of her face, a black eye and a painful knot on her forehead. Fortunately, Patty survived the incident and a spokesman for the Lightning issued an apology on behalf of the team. Her attorney claimed that she could have easily lost her eye in the accident and insisted the arena update its safety protocols. However, it's worth noting that fans who attend NHL games enter an agreement that absolves the stadium and the team of any liability for potential injuries. Number 10. Unnamed Women In July of 2021, two young women plunged off the top of a 6,300-foot cliff in the Sulak Canyon of Dagestan, Russia, while on a precipice swing set. They had been rocking back and forth for almost a minute while somebody from the staff of the tourist attraction was pushing them from behind to create more momentum. At some point as the swing was again going towards the edge, one of the chains holding a seat snapped, launching the women over the steep cliffs. Luckily, they landed on a small wooden platform installed just beyond the edge, which broke their fall and ended up saving their lives. The two women were dragged back to safety by shocked onlookers, and they miraculously suffered no grave injuries. Number 9. Michelle Meda On June the 20th of 2021, 53-year-old Michelle Meda of Hudson, Ohio, was hiking on the Toronto Trail near Monument Creek in the Grand Canyon National Park as part of a three-day backpacking trip from Hermit to Bright Angel Trail. She was accompanied by her husband, her two adult children and a friend of the children. As the temperature reached about 115 degrees, she grew disoriented and later became unconscious. In an attempt to get help, the three younger adults left the group and ended up hiking for two miles downhill to a commercial rafting boat equipped with a satellite phone. The National Park Service received their call about the woman suffering from heat illness at around 1.15 p.m. and sent rangers to help. A few days prior, they'd issued a warning informing tourists that rescue efforts would be delayed during the summer because of limited staff and reduced helicopter flying capability stemming from the extreme heat and the higher number of calls. Unfortunately, by the time they managed to arrive at her location, Meda had already passed away. The Rangers believed the cause to have been heat-related, but the woman's death is still under investigation. Number 8. Gaylene McEwen In July of 2017, a 57-year-old mother of three was killed by the blast of a jet engine while visiting the seaside airport of Princess Juliana on St. Martin in the Caribbean. Gaylene McEwen from New Zealand was on holiday with her husband and friends. They wanted to see Maho Beach, a spot that has become famous over the years for the beachside airplane runway where tourists 
can watch jets touch down at just 100 feet above their heads. When they got there, McEwen and her family approached to the fence, separating the beach from the runway. Despite the written signs that warned the tourists not to get too close, they were clinging to the fence as a Boeing 737 was taken off. McEwen was desperately trying to hold on to it as the airplane's engine blasted. After only a couple of seconds, she lost her grip and was blown away into the concrete barrier behind her. As she fell, McEwen hit her head, suffering devastating injuries. Paramedics rushed to the scene and desperately struggled to save the woman after seeing that she hadn't immediately passed away. Unfortunately, according to reports, McEwen succumbed to her injuries shortly afterwards. Number 7. Suzanne Astle In October of 2016, 48-year-old Suzanne Astle from Kenilworth, England, was on a half-term holiday in South Africa with her husband and their two sons. Early in the morning of October the 26th, they embarked on a hot air balloon in Skierport along with 10 other tourists. The balloon reportedly took off in good weather conditions, but as it approached the town of Muinui, it was swept away by high winds and soon crashed between two trees. According to a paramedic who was at the scene, the basket tilted when it was around 20 feet from the ground, causing Astel and two other passengers to be thrown over. The woman suffered grave injuries to her head and was taken to the nearest hospital. She arrived about four hours later, along with her husband and two sons, who were also injured. Although her family survived, Astel didn't recover and she died later that day. The investigation report found that the pilot was inexperienced and had decided to execute the landing in unsafe conditions. Moreover, the pilot was the only one securely fastened in the basket and had also failed to radio for help after the crash. Number 6. Shiaida Hosanzade Elk River Falls in North Carolina is a tourist attraction popular among thrill-seeking travelers. The 50-foot mountain waterfall cascades over a rock cliff and into an oval pool, which is safe for swimming. However, diving from the rock cliff has proven to be deadly on numerous occasions. In August of 2015, 26-year-old Shida Hosan Zeda, a student at UNC Charlotte, was visiting the falls with her friends and family. She decided to jump from the top of the waterfall and launched herself over the cascade. According to an onlooker who witnessed the scene, she'd come up at first but was then quickly pulled below the water's surface. People at the scene immediately called the emergency services and about 54 responders from various agencies arrived at the scene and worked together in an effort to save the young woman. They unfortunately were unsuccessful as they later found her lifeless body after more than four hours of searching the premises. Multiple media outlets reported that Hossan Zeda had jumped into a shallow portion of the pool and could have been injured by hitting an underwater ledge. Number 5. Guatape Boat Tragedy On June the 25th of 2017, a four-story tourist ferry boat with nearly 170 passengers on board sank in Guatape, 28 miles east of Medellin, Colombia. Shortly after the ship began its cruise, passengers reportedly heard a loud explosion near the men's bathroom. The boat began teetering back and forth and started sinking rapidly. Tourists immediately started climbing to upper decks in an attempt to stay above the surface while other boats and jet skis that were nearby rushed to save as many people as they could. Rescue boats helped 99 people to safety and 40 others reached the shore themselves. Nine people died in the incident. Many survivors claimed they hadn't been given life vests upon embarking. The cause of the accident has not been made public. However, Marilyn Usme, a local business owner, reported that there had been a previous incident involving the same boat three months prior to the tragedy. The woman told a local radio station that it all happened at night with no passengers on board at the time and that the boat was fixed and put back into circulation. Number 4. Christy Kafkaloudis On September the 5th of 2015, 24-year-old Christy Kafkaloudis from Queensland, Australia was hiking a Norwegian trail up to Trolltunga along with some friends. They reached the popular panoramic rock formation which translates as Troll Tongue and juts horizontally from the mountain high above Lake Ringadalsvatna. Upon reaching the edge, Kafkaludis lost her balance and fell to her death 980 feet into a gorge. According to the early reports that followed the accident, it seemed that the young woman was attempting to take a selfie when she fell. However, her mother later made a statement saying Kafkaludis was not taking a photo. As the spot was especially crowded that day, she'd been waiting out on the rock for other people to pass 
so that she could rejoin her friends who were walking ahead. Number 3. Andrea Watton On August the 8th of 2010, 21-year-old Andrea Watton from Salisbury, England, was on an expedition with friends in the Swiss Alps. They were on an adventure route known as the Gorges Alpines near the resort of Sasfi, where they were using bridges, seps, steel cables, and a ladder. At one point, they decided to go on a cable ride to cross a ravine. When they got on their third cable on the route, Watton allegedly decided not to use a safety rope implement. As police spokesman Vincent Favre explained, every zip wire has two cables for the harness and another one attached to wheels, meant to help the rider slow down and brake. When Watton made a choice to only fix two hooks to the cable before going down the line, her companions had their reservations. In spite of their concerns, the student launched herself onto the zip line, but upon approaching the other side, she was unable to brake. She violently crashed into a rock face at full speed and died instantly. Number 2. Alexander Hellweger On March the 1st of 2015, 28-year-old Italian man Alexander Hellweger was on vacation in Alaska along with seven friends. Initially, they'd been transported by a helicopter to the backcountry for heli skiing and snowboarding. Later, the group's guides took them to Lake George Glacier, north of Anchorage, as they were nearing the head of the glacier and viewing it up close, they decided to gather for a group photo. That's when a large piece of ice began cracking. Some members of the party ran at the sound, but Hellweger didn't manage to escape. The massive fragment eventually broke off and fell onto him, crushing him to death. The troopers weren't able to immediately recover his body due to diminishing light and the danger of more ice breaking. Number 1. Yesenia Morales on July the 18th of 2021, 25-year-old Yesenia Morales and her boyfriend were on a bridge in Amaga, northern Colombia, preparing for a bungee jump. The staff had fixed on her harness, but was still in the process of attaching her cord when her boyfriend received the leap signal. Morales heard it and mistakenly thought the signal was meant for her. She proceeded to jump from the bridge without the safety cord and fell to her death 150 feet from the viaduct. To put that drop into perspective, it would be like falling from halfway up the Statue of Liberty. Morales' boyfriend rushed to the spot where she'd crashed to try and help her. He was the first one to find her body on the ground and perform CPR, but she was already dead. As doctors later revealed, Morales had suffered a heart attack before reaching the ground. Number 10. Merlin McAllister On March the 14th of 2021, 51-year-old construction worker Merlin McAllister a Bayesian immigrant living in the west side of Chicago with his wife of 25 years took the family dog out for a Sunday morning walk. It was a weekly routine he'd kept up for many years, but that particular morning would end in tragedy. While taking the dog around the block, McAllister was shot three times by an unknown gunman. His wife heard the gunfire and ran to her husband's aid. She was shocked to see him lying on the ground with bloody bullet wounds in his torso. He was pronounced dead after being transported to Loyola Hospital. McAllister was survived by his wife, three children, and his dog. Number 9. Isabella Tallas In June of 2020, 21-year-old Isabella Tallas took her dog for a walk outside her apartment building in Denver, Colorado. Her boyfriend, 27-year-old Dorian Simon, joined her. Simon soon became embroiled in a contentious argument with another resident in the apartment complex, Michael Close, age 37. He felt that Talis and Simon were not adequately managing their dog's misbehavior and he began to shout down at them from his apartment window. As the altercation escalated, Close pulled out an AR-15 and opened fire on the couple. Talis died at the scene after sustaining multiple gunshot wounds. Simon was hit twice himself but ultimately survived the incident after being transported to a hospital and undergoing surgery on his shattered femur. Simon, along with Talis' father, later filed a lawsuit against Close and former Denver Police Sergeant Daniel Politica, the owner of the firearm used in the murder. Politica, who was Michael Close's friend and confidant, had apparently been concerned about his friend's mental state leading up to the shooting. Politica owned a gun shop called Tyrant Arms, LLC, though he insisted that Close had obtained the AR-15 without his knowledge. Simon and Talis' father were seeking $100,000 in the civil suit. Close has since been charged with 18 counts, including murder in the first degree 
as a result of the tragic episode. Colorado Governor Jared Polis signed a bill that requires gun owners to report stolen firearms to the proper authorities. The law was named the Isabella Joy Tallis Act in honor of the victim. Number 8. Michael Canals 26-year-old Michael Canals of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, was a professional in the music industry. Three months prior to the tragic incident that occurred on October the 26th of 2019, Canals had adopted a rescue dog, Rosie, after she'd followed him home. While he was out with Rosie on a walk through the streets of Philadelphia, the two became the victims of a violent hit and run. A career in minivan struck the man and his dog on the sidewalk and subsequently fled the scene. The police were able to track down the vehicle later that day, but they discovered it had been stolen before the incident, so the van's owner was not the perpetrator they were after. A couple of weeks later, Philadelphia police apprehended a man by the name of Khalif Moore, who they believed to be the individual behind the hit and run that resulted in the deaths of both Canals and Rosie. Moore had already served time in prison for drug and weapons charges. Canals and his beloved dog were ultimately buried together by his family. Number 7. Winston McKay 40-year-old Winston McKay of Upper Manhattan had just finished celebrating his anniversary with his husband of two years when he was met with a stray bullet from an altercation of which he wasn't even a part. In June of 2019, McKay and the family dog, Milton, were out for a walk in the park across the street from their apartment. As they made their way back home, McKay stumbled upon an argument between two men on the street. The shouting match soon turned violent and rifle shots were fired. McKay, who was simply minding his own business, was hit by one of the bullets. Despite being rushed to the hospital, he passed away from his wounds a short while later. The New York Police Department's investigation into the murder resulted in two arrests. Augier McLean and Eric Batista were identified on surveillance footage as the two men on the street. They were engaged in a dispute over drugs when McLean fired the shot that led to McKay's untimely demise. According to McKay's husband, their dog Milton still slept by their bed, waiting for his owner to return home. Number 6. Milan Longcar 25-year-old Milan Longcar of Philadelphia was a recent college graduate with a brand new job and plans to move in with his girlfriend, who he hoped to propose to soon. All of his plans for the future came to a tragic end at about 7 p.m. on January the 13th of 2021. Lon Carr was out walking his dog in Brewery Town, a neighborhood in the city's north, when he was approached by two hooded men. One of them stood in front of him, the other behind him. The two thugs proceeded to rob the young man and, as surveillance footage would later indicate, they then pulled out a gun and shot him in the chest. The attackers ran away, leaving Lon Carr to slowly bleed out on the sidewalk. He was able to pull out his phone and call 911 all while holding on to his dog's leash. Unfortunately, while he did make it to Temple University Hospital, he eventually passed away. 20-year-old Josephus Davis was arrested a week later and accused of carrying out the murder. Davis had been released from prison just two weeks prior to killing Longcar after serving time for a separate carjacking incident. Number 5. Lauren Rice An English professor at a local community college in Des Moines Iowa met a swift and tragic end as she walked her dog on a Sunday morning in April of 2020. Her name was Lauren Rice and she was a staple of the Des Moines community due to her tireless efforts both as an instructor at the college and the institution's coordinator for their study abroad program in London. She had been self-quarantining at her house leading up to the incident that claimed her life. While enjoying some fresh air with her dog, Rice was suddenly struck by a pickup truck that had mounted the sidewalk and knocked over several telephone poles as it seemingly went out of control. The driver of the vehicle in question was 50-year-old Jason Sassman, who in the past had been in and out of jail multiple times. The authorities determined that Sassman had purposefully run into Rice and her dog, killing both and he was charged with second-degree murder. Number 4. Jesse Streikest and Jacob Vogelman 24-year-old Jesse Streikest of Brooklyn, New York and her boyfriend, Jacob Vogelman, became victims of extreme weather on October the 29th of 2012. At the time, they were taking their dog Max on a stroll through Ditmas Park in Brooklyn. Unfortunately for the young couple and their canine companion, 
New York was on the cusp of being utterly ravaged by the storms brought about by Hurricane Sandy. The hurricane swept through the streets of Brooklyn at the same time Jesse and Jacob were walking with Max, and the resulting damage was devastating. Power lines were toppled, streets were flooded, and trees came crashing to the ground. The latter occurrences proved especially perilous for the young New Yorkers in Dipmas Park that night. One tree was uprooted from the sidewalk and struck Jesse and Jacob where they stood. They were killed instantly. Max was taken to an emergency veterinary hospital and survived, though he was forced to live on without his loving owners. Number 3. Kate Ledbetter and Matthew Field Kate Ledbetter and Matthew Field were a happy young couple from Alexandra Hills in Australia. They were proud dog owners and were expecting yet another addition to the family in the form of their unborn son, Miles. It was Australia Day 2021, a national holiday celebrated every January in order to commemorate the first European settlement on the continent in 1788. When the pair took their dogs out for a walk that day, they became the victims of a violent car accident. The couple was hit head-on by a stolen car being driven by an unnamed 17-year-old perpetrator who was intoxicated at the time. The couple was killed on impact. The driver faced many charges as a result of his deadly hit and run, but the Australian authorities were unable to hold him legally accountable for the death of the couple's unborn baby. Number 2. Harassment in Everett Park A man was killed while walking his dog near a park in Everett, Washington, but the circumstances leading up to his death were more complicated as reports indicated that the unnamed victim had played an active part in his own demise. On May the 11th of 2021, the man in question was taking his dog for a walk through Everett Park when he approached an elderly woman and her granddaughter and began harassing them. According to witnesses at the scene, the man was waving a metal baton in their faces, shouting at them and threatening them with pepper spray. Multiple bystanders had sprung into action in an attempt to defend the woman and her young granddaughter, but the belligerent man turned his hostility on them as well, spraying several people with pepper spray. Two friends who were fishing nearby heard the commotion and decided to find out what was going on. They came upon the scene and tried to defuse the dog walker's aggression, but in turn, they too were threatened with pepper spray. Before being sprayed, however, an armed citizen entered the fray and shot the dog walker. The gunman, who'd acted under the impression that the pepper spray in the man's hand was a gun, was subsequently arrested by police. Number 1. Raymel Boston Having survived a bout with leukemia in his earlier years, 29-year-old Raymel Boston had already experienced considerable turmoil before the attack that claimed his life. In 2021, Boston, a resident of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was walking through the city streets with his dog on July the 30th. The specific circumstances surrounding the altercation that ultimately led to his death are unknown, but neighbors claim they saw him speaking with someone driving a gray vehicle. Witnesses reported seeing him running down an alley after being threatened by the driver. Moments later, several gunshots were heard. By the time his body was found, Boston had already succumbed to the wounds he'd sustained in the attack. Number 8. Steve Palmer In 2020, a man from Birmingham, England, contracted flesh-eating bacteria while gardening and nearly lost his hand. 34-year-old Steve Palmer had been clearing flood damage from his garden. With the help of his wife and two young sons, he suffered a small scratch to his hand, which he didn't think much of at first. By the following morning, however, he was no longer able to move his finger and, later in the day, suffered throbbing pains and a fever. He'd contracted necrotizing fasciitis, a rare bacterial infection with a high mortality rate that eats away at flesh and progresses very quickly. 24 hours after the initial scratch, Palmer was experiencing what he described as the worst pain he'd ever felt, as the flesh on the back of his hand had begun to rot away. He was transported for specialist care at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, where doctors were successful in stopping the infection from spreading. Palmer was in surgery for nearly five hours as staff worked to clear the dead tissue in an effort to save his hand. They subsequently started reconstructing it by grafting flesh from further up the arm. Palmer was quoted as saying, I can't believe something like this could happen from gardening, and in the aftermath, urged others to wear gardening gloves and clean every injury no matter how small. Number 7. Vesna Chernobyl. 
In November 2014, 48-year-old Vesna Chernobyl and her husband Zoran were gardening at their home in Kasula in Sydney Southwest. A neighbor reported that a heated argument had broken out between the two. Then the neighbor heard Vesna scream and afterwards saw her lying motionless on the ground with Zoran standing near her body. It would later be revealed that the 52-year-old had strangled his wife to death. Zoran then drove off and used Vesna's cell phone to call their son, reportedly telling him, Alex, I've killed your mum. He was arrested upon his return to the residence. He had scratches to his hands, shoulders, neck and face, which Vesna had inflicted as she fought for her life. According to the police, they'd been called to their Flame Tree Street home prior to the incident. It was later determined that the argument had been about Zoran's mental health, with reports indicating he'd been admitted to a number of facilities in the past. A physical struggle ensued and Vesna desperately tried to get away from her husband. By Zoran's recollection of the events, he caught her and they started to fight, at which point he just jumped her. He claimed that he couldn't remember much beyond that point. He was ultimately found not guilty of killing his wife by reason of mental illness and was scheduled for psychiatric evaluation, which would establish when he'd be fit for release. Number 6. Teresa Edwards In July of 2016, a woman from West Sussex, England suffered a gruesome accident while gardening alongside her husband. 59-year-old Teresa Edwards was using a lawnmower to cut thigh-high grass. She reached down to unclog the machine but accidentally placed her hand between the box and the blade. The lawnmower severed off three of her fingertips. The shock initially prevented her from feeling any pain and as she removed her gardening glove, Edward saw blood gushing from her open wounds. To stop the blood from pumping into her fingers, she raised her arm in the air above the heart level. Her husband started looking for the severed tips as they waited for the ambulance. One was recovered from the grass while the other two were found by paramedics in the lawnmower's box. Edwards was rushed to the trauma unit of the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead. While there, she was given a choice of amputation or of having the fingertips reattached. The cuts that the lawnmower blade had inflicted weren't clean, which is why a reattachment only had a 50% chance of success. It would involve a 15-hour surgery, a recovery period of at least a year, and having leeches attached to her fingers that would drain the blood so that she could regain movement. Amputation, which Edwards ultimately opted for, could be performed the following day under a local anesthetic and with a much shorter rehab period. In the months following the amputation, Edwards suffered from pain in addition to depression and anxiety as she constantly relived the moment of her life-changing injury. Number 5. Sue Bramley in October of 2013, detectives arrived at the home of Sue Bramley in Mansfield, Nottinghamshire, asking permission to dig up her garden, claiming an incident had occurred. Bramley had moved into the home eight years prior, and the garden was one of her favorite things about it. On one patch of land, however, grass wouldn't grow, and the woman turned it into a bed for her teenage daughter to plant flowers. It was that area of the garden where police dogs first headed as they were brought on the premises. The authorities also used a digger and, by the end of the day, a horrific truth emerged. Inside a shallow grave, they found the bodies of former owners Patricia and William Witcherly. The elderly couple had been gunned down in 1998 by their daughter, Susan, and her husband, Christopher Edwards. On the day of the double murder, neighbors would report seeing Christopher up to his waist digging in the garden. The bodies were wrapped in duvets and dumped in the grave. For 15 years, the killers made it seem that the Witcherleys were still alive, forging letters and documents so that they could collect their pensions. The couple stole nearly £300,000 from their victims but didn't have a lavish lifestyle, spending most of the money on movie memorabilia and authenticated autographs of celebrities they admired. They regularly traveled to the house to maintain the garden, presumably concerned that someone would uncover their crimes but eventually sold it. Susan and Christopher turned themselves in after fleeing to France and amassing considerable debt and were each sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 25 years served. In spite of the garden's dark history, Bramley and her daughter were determined not to move. Number 4. John Claiborne In April of 2021, Australian TV director John Claiborne died in a freak gardening accident at his home in Attermon, 
on Sydney's North Shore. 52-year-old Claiborne had over three decades' experience in television and was known for his work on popular series Home and Away and Underbelly. When the incident occurred, he was using a cordless power saw to trim the hedges in his garden. His wife, Melissa, was in the kitchen when she heard a branch breaking and rushed outside. She found Claiborne crawling on his stomach and clutching his torso with blood gushing from his hand. He'd somehow cut into his hand with the power tool and then plummeted nearly 10 feet from the ladder. Ambulances arrived at his home and rushed Claiborne to Royal North Shore Hospital, where he passed away after going into cardiac arrest from severe blood loss. He was survived by his wife and two sons. Number 3. Elam Bador In August of 2021, an elderly Cleveland woman nearly lost her life after being caught in the crossfire during a drive-by and a shootout in the neighborhood of Cadell. At the time, 74-year-old Ellen Bador was picking weeds from the garden in her front yard. Witnesses reported that, at around 2 p.m., a car pulled up on a group that was playing basketball in the street. The occupants of the vehicle started shooting at them and the basketball players returned fire. A 19-year-old man was shot in the street while two people in the car, also reported as being in their late teens, also sustained gunshot injuries. None of those involved in the shootout have been named and their condition is unclear. The police offered a $5,000 reward in the aftermath for information that would lead to their prosecution. Bador was taken to the hospital in critical condition after being shot in the hand and abdomen. Family members reported that she needed to have part of her colon and intestine surgically removed. According to the latest updates on the case, medical staff had managed to stabilize her. Number 2. Lucinda Smith In March of 2015, a mother of two from England died after scratching the back of her hand while gardening and developing a dangerous infection. A few days after the minor scrape, 43-year-old Lucinda Smith complained of a pain in her shoulder and went to see a GP. The medical specialist didn't check her blood pressure or test her blood and sent Smith away with a prescription for an antidepressant to relax her muscles and help her sleep. After diagnosing her with a trapped nerve, the woman's condition continued to deteriorate over the next few days as she was in greater pain with her fingers and arm becoming red and swollen. Smith was eventually admitted to the emergency room at Basildon Hospital. It was there that within 30 minutes a simple blood test revealed she had contracted sepsis and doctors immediately started treating her with intravenous antibiotics. Sepsis, a potentially deadly condition, is the body's extreme immune response while trying to fight off an infection, which can reduce the supply of blood to other organs. Had it been detected earlier, Smith would have likely survived. As her organs ceased functioning properly, she succumbed to cardiovascular, renal, and respiratory failure five days after injuring her hand in the garden. Number 1. Christopher K. In 2020, a man from Carlin Howe in North Yorkshire, England, was fatally shot with an air rifle while tending to his garden. 58-year-old Christopher K., described as a dearly loved grandfather by his family, had gone to a hospital appointment and then had lunch with a friend before returning home on August the 21st. Jamie Hellings, a man in his early 30s, was severely intoxicated as he was traveling in a car with two friends. Kay was in front of his house working in the garden which was concealed by a large hedge when Hellings fired the air rifle out of the car window. The pellet struck Kay in the chest. He called an ambulance and told the operator he'd been shot. Kay was tended to by his neighbors but by the time he was transported to a Middlesbrough hospital, went into cardiac arrest. Kay passed away and Hellings, after realizing he'd been responsible for the incident, surrendered to the authorities. He claimed that he'd never meant to fire the rifle and that it had accidentally discharged while he was handling it. He pled guilty to manslaughter and was jailed for six years and eight months. Number 9. Emma Evans In early September of 2015, Welsh woman Emma Evans was enjoying a holiday to Mallorca with her husband and their eldest child. The room that the 37-year-old was staying in didn't have air conditioning to better cope with the heat and humidity. On September the 2nd, Evans went to sleep on the balcony. The woman had what was described as a propensity to sleepwalk, but it was also reported that she'd consumed a considerable amount of alcohol that night. 
At some point, Evans sleepwalked over the edge of the balcony and fell to the ground over 50 feet, sustaining fatal injuries. A Swansea coroner recorded a verdict of accidental death. Number 8. Rob Williams In late 2013, Rob Williams visited colleagues at a hotel in Waltham Cross, England after a work Christmas party. 27-year-old Williams, who was prone to sleepwalking, was staying elsewhere and had joined two of his colleagues for a night of drinking. The following morning, the others woke up and found that he wasn't there. They noticed that the window was open but didn't think much of it. They assumed that Williams had left even though his coat and shoes were still in the room. The men went to get breakfast and took his belongings back to the office with them. Later that day, the secretary of the firm where the men worked contacted Williams' partner to inquire about his whereabouts. It was then that the alarm was raised. Later in the afternoon, a workman in a first-floor room noticed Williams lying on a rain-soaked roof. He'd sleepwalked out of the window and fallen 13 feet. After he was knocked unconscious, Williams spent the night freezing on the roof. He was taken to the hospital with advanced hypothermia and severe head injuries. After five days in the intensive care unit, he passed away on Christmas Day without ever regaining consciousness. Number 7. Crushed by Dumpster Truck On September the 5th of 2012, the body of a 50-year-old man was discovered by staff at a material recycling facility in Wirral, England. Local police determined that his death had been the result of a tragic accident. The unnamed man, believed to have been homeless, had fallen asleep inside a wheelie bin. As the bin was emptied into a compactor truck, the man was horrifically crushed and sustained fatal head injuries. His death was just one of several similar occurrences. In 2016, the body of Anthony Todd was discovered at a landfill in Tallahassee, Florida. A bulldozer driver saw his leg sticking out of a trash pile. It was theorized that Todd had climbed inside a dumpster to stay warm and had fallen into a deep sleep. The 43-year-old failed to wake up when the garbage truck emptied the contents of the dumpster and was crushed. In 2021, an Australian teenager named Spencer Benbolt had fallen asleep in a wheelie bin along with two other boys. When the garbage truck came around, the others woke up. One was able to jump out and alert the driver. However, by the time the more of the machine came to a halt, Ben Bolt had already been fatally crushed. Number 6. Anusha Ranganathan In June of 2018, Anusha Ranganathan fell asleep behind the wheel of her car and crashed into 70-year-old Patricia Robinson on a road in Oxfordshire, England. At the time, Ranganathan was tired after a sleepless night with her 18-month-old son, who'd had heart surgery. The 41-year-old businesswoman believed that she was fit to drive. However, as she drifted to sleep, she veered her Toyota into the opposite lane and crashed into the pensioner's Nissan Duke. After the frontal collision, both vehicles ended in a waterlogged roadside ditch. Ranganathan's baby, who was in the car at the time, fell from his car seat. Good Samaritans, who'd witnessed the brutal crash, found him crying in the footspace and extracted both him and his mother just before the Toyota burst into flames. They also pulled out Robinson as there was a threat of the flames extending to her car as well. Ranganathan and her child survived. However, Robinson's injuries were described as being the most extensive suffered by a person without resulting in immediate death. She had ruptured nearly every organ in her body. The grandmother of four died in the hospital nearly five weeks later. Ranganathan pled guilty to death by dangerous driving and was given a sentence of two and a half years in prison. Number 5. Erin Peach Pitts in December of 2009, Florida teenager Erin Peach Pitts fell asleep while breastfeeding her 13-day-old daughter. When she woke up, Peach Pitts found that the baby was unresponsive. She was rushed to the hospital and subsequently pronounced dead. Doctors determined that she'd succumbed to asphyxia due to probable overlay and co-sleeping and ruled the death accidental. In the years that followed, Peach Pitts was arrested for a slew of offenses, which included, among others, domestic battery, larceny, and burglary. In 2016, while pregnant with her second child, 25-year-old Peach Pitts was arrested for methamphetamine possession and spent a month in jail. Considering the past incident as well as her criminal record, she was ordered to attend classes on the dangers of co-sleeping. Before taking her son home from the hospital that September, Peach Pitts was again given detailed instructions on how to safely put a baby to bed. A few weeks later, 
when her 18-day-year-old son woke up crying. Pish Pitts took him from his bassinet. She placed him on the bed with his head in the crook of her arm. A few hours later, in an incident that mirrored the first, Pish Pitts woke up to find that her newborn was unresponsive. The child passed away in a Winter Haven hospital. Pish Pitts was charged with manslaughter after the authorities determined the child had died due to her own negligence. Number 4. Cullen Green On a Sunday night in 2016, Cullen Green attended a wedding at a venue in Harris County, Texas. 27-year-old Green, believed to have been inebriated at the time, fell asleep in an outdoor bathroom. He awoke up in the early hours of Monday, after the guests had all left and the owner had locked up. Confused, Green forced his way through the locked door and broke into the venue's main hall. It was then that he was confronted by an on-site property manager. A physical altercation ensued that concluded with the manager shooting Green several times. He was airlifted to a nearby hospital in serious condition, but doctors expected he would recover. It's unclear what legal actions, if any, were taken against Green or the manager. Number 3. Jai Ram in March of 2016, an Indian man was buried alive in concrete after falling asleep at a construction site. 24-year-old Jai Ram was part of a team working at the Pench River Dam project in Madhya Pradesh. Ram was taking a nap inside a duct when the other workers started filling it with concrete without checking if anyone was inside. They then used a steamroller to level the gravel in the early hours of the morning. It was only after Ram's family had reported him missing that a second team re-examined the site and noticed a hand sticking out of the gravel. After digging through the concrete, they were able to retrieve Ram's body. The others in his crew fled after the authorities claimed they'd be arrested for culpable homicide, not amounting to murder. Number 2. Matthew Phelps On September the 1st of 2017, Matthew Phelps brutally murdered his wife Lauren at their home in Raleigh, North Carolina. Matthew called 911 and claimed he'd awoken to find himself covered in blood, his wife dead, and a knife on the bed. He told the dispatcher, I think I did it, but added that he'd taken excessive cough medicine because he had trouble sleeping. Lauren was found in the fetal position on the floor of the couple's bedroom. An autopsy would subsequently determine that she'd been stabbed 123 times. In his defense, Matthew claimed that he wasn't aware of his actions at the time and that he'd killed his wife in a medicine-induced dream. While it is recognized as a phenomenon, there aren't many cases of homicidal sleepwalking, and their veracity is mostly disputed. During the deepest stages of slow-wave sleep, the brain will sometimes get stuck between being asleep and awake, allowing people to unconsciously perform various actions. The connection between sleepwalking and murder isn't well understood, but it's believed to involve other factors like stress, anxiety, depression, drugs, or alcohol. Matthew and Lauren, both 29, had only been married for about a year, and as the victim's family reported, seemed perfectly happy together. During the trial, aspersions would be cast on Matthew's defense. When it emerged that he'd privately wondered to a friend what it would be like to kill somebody. He also harbored an obsession for American Psycho and its serial killer protagonist, Patrick Bateman. Additionally, there'd been problems in the marriage stemming from Matthew's excessive spending, with Lauren restricting his finances and threatening to end their relationship. To avoid the death penalty, Matthew ultimately pled guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life without parole. Number 1. Death of 16 Indian Workers In 2020, 16 migrant workers were run over by a train in the Indian state of Maharashtra after falling asleep on the tracks. Many of the country's industrial branches were suddenly stopped, on March the 24th, as a consequence of the pandemic lockdown, fearing they would starve to death, numerous migrant workers chose to return to their home villages. Since the few bus and train lines that were operational followed irregular schedules, many were forced to walk home. Twenty workers employed by an ironworks factory in Jalna had been walking towards a station in Aurangabad, hoping to eventually catch a train home. After a grueling trek of over 26 miles, the exhausted workers rested on the tracks. They'd been walking along the train lines for some time and hadn't seen any go by. They therefore assumed the lines weren't operational because of the restrictions. Unfortunately, as they slept, a freight train started traveling their way. The conductor reportedly tried to alert them, as did a few of the workers who'd been sleeping beside the tracks. With no time to react, 
16 of the workers were mowed down. A mangled mass of body parts and personal belongings littered the tracks in the train's wake. In the aftermath, Prime Minister Narendra Modi tweeted that he was extremely anguished by the loss of lives. Number 8. Catherine Shaw On March the 5th of 2019, British backpacker Catherine Shaw was reported missing after being last seen in the town of San Juan, La Laguna, Guatemala. 23-year-old Shaw, a yoga teacher, was described as a spiritual person who enjoyed being surrounded by nature. She'd reportedly been fasting for a few days when, in the early hours of the morning, she left her hotel to watch the sunset on a mountain hiking trail. Shaw's body was found on March the 11th, unclothed and in an advanced state of decomposition. She'd sustained bruising, lacerations and a traumatic brain injury. Authorities initially suspected she'd been murdered, but further examination along with a statement released by her family changed that perspective. They noted that Shaw was very comfortable in her own skin and that it was likely she'd removed her clothing herself. Foul play was ruled out and it was determined she'd either slipped or fainted, potentially due to the lack of food intake, while climbing to a vantage point. Number 7. Palace Backpackers Hostel Arson Disaster On June the 23rd of 2000, a fire ravaged the Palace Backpackers Hotel in Childers, Australia, claiming the lives of 15 backpackers. The blaze had been deliberately ignited by itinerant fruit picker Robert Paul Long, who had expressed a hatred of backpackers and held a grudge against the hostel after being evicted for missing rent. He'd reportedly told a visiting couple to leave their windows and doors open as he was planning to burn down the place. 37-year-old Long, who still had a key to the hostel, started the fire in the downstairs rec room at around 1 a.m. The 100-year-old building was made out of timber and didn't have smoke detectors or working fire alarms. The blaze rapidly spread to the upper levels, voraciously consuming the wooden structure. Chaos ensued as backpackers struggled to escape through the thick black smoke. In a second floor room, a bunk bed blocked an exit and the windows were barred. Ten of the deceased victims were subsequently found inside. It took roughly four hours for firefighters to extinguish the blaze, a time during which they'd raised the ladder, allowing some of the victims to get out. Nine women and six men from Britain, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Ireland and the Netherlands perished in the fire. Residents from the town of Childers banded together, offering support in the form of food, blankets and housing for the survivors. Five days later, the police tracked down and confronted Long in the bushland, about 20 miles from Childers. He stabbed an officer in the chin and slashed a police dog before a second officer shot him in the arm. Long was sentenced to life in prison and became eligible for parole in 2020. Number 6. Alix Stoffel In the summer of 2016, a young French backpacker was killed in a freak accident after a year-long trip around Australia. 19-year-old Alix Stoffel had flown to the country shortly after completing her university degree in July of 2015 and had since been detailing her experiences in a travel blog. Roughly a year later, Stoffel had hitched a ride to Nudgee, North Brisbane, with a semi-trailer driver. As she got out at a service station, Stoffel dropped her backpack and it ended up underneath the truck. She then stumbled while trying to retrieve it. At the same time, the driver set the vehicle in motion. Stoffel was dragged on the ground, suffering devastating injuries. CCTV footage from the station's security system captured the moment that bystanders tried to help her. In spite of their efforts, she passed away at the scene. Number 5. Caroline Stuttle On April the 10th of 2002, late at night, Caroline Stuttle was returning to the Bundaberg Caravan Park she'd been staying at in Australia's Queensland state. Ian Previte, who was described as a drifter and a drug addict, was making his way south from Cairns and was staying at a hostel in Bundaberg, where he'd met a dealer. As she was crossing the Burnett River Bridge, 19-year-old Stuttle encountered Previte at the time he was high on a cocktail of morphine, antidepressants and cannabis. He attacked the backpacker and tried to steal her bag. Stuttle didn't let go and in the ensuing struggle, Previte threw her off the bridge. The young woman plummeted 33 feet below, suffering fatal head and spinal injuries. The friend she'd been traveling with called the authorities when Stuttle didn't return to the caravan park and her body was later found at the bottom of the bridge. The bag that Previte had made off with contained less than $5. The words, I throw the girl off the bridge, I am sorry, 
were reportedly found inscribed on a bench near the hostel where he'd been staying. 32-year-old Previte was sentenced to life in prison and after serving part of his sentence, was released on parole in 2020. In the aftermath of her death, Stuttle's family started Caroline's Rainbow Foundation, which helps backpackers and young travelers stay safe abroad. Number 4. Simone Strobel Over a decade and a half since it occurred in 2005, the murder of German backpacker Simone Strobel remains a mystery. Strobel had been traveling through Australia with her boyfriend, Tobias Sukfield, his sister Katrin, and their friend Jens Martin. They checked into the Lismore Tourist Caravan Park in New South Wales on February the 11th. Shortly before midnight, the group left a hotel bar and returned to the caravan park where they continued drinking together. The following morning at 10.45 a.m., Strobel's companions went to a Lismore police station and declared her missing. She'd reportedly left the campsite at night following an argument that had erupted between Katrin and Tobias. Six days later, Strobel's nude body was found covered with palm fronds on a bocce court. Her cause of death remains unconfirmed, but is suspected to have been due to asphyxia or suffocation. There wasn't any evidence to indicate that her companions had been involved in the murder, and her killer or killers remain unidentified. In 2020, the New South Wales government and police announced a $1 million reward for any information leading to an arrest. Number 3. China Deese and Lucas Fowler in July of 2019, a pair of teenagers went on a killing spree in Canada, claiming the lives of a university lecturer and a backpacking couple. American woman China Deese and her Australian boyfriend, Lucas Fowler, both in their early 20s, were on a dream road trip through the country. The last time that Deese's mother had heard from her was on July the 13th, when she checked in and told her not to worry because they wouldn't have Wi-Fi for a while. The following day, the couple's Chevrolet van broke down along the Alaska Highway about 20 miles from Leard Hot Springs. A local mechanic and his wife had stopped to assist them. He reported that Deese and Fowler were having a picnic and assured him that they had the situation under control. The mechanic described them as happy and smiling. The next morning, a highway worker found their bodies in a ditch close to their van, dead from gunshot wounds. The windows of the vehicle were smashed and the doors had been left open. A few days later, and 290 miles away, on a highway south of the Stikine River, the authorities discovered a torched pickup truck. University of British Columbia botany lecturer Leonard Dyke was found gunned down a little over a mile from the vehicle. He'd been executed in a manner similar to the backpacking couple. It was revealed that the pickup had been operated by Cam McLeod and Bryash Magelski, aged 18 and 19 respectively. They were initially reported as missing persons by the authorities, but became murder suspects when it was revealed they'd stolen and burned down Dyke's Toyota RAV4. In the span of 10 days with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police on their trail, the teens traversed roughly 2,000 miles in four provinces. The manhunt came to involve assistance from the military in the form of a Lockheed C-130 Hercules aircraft for aerial sweeps using high thermal detection gear. The massive search effort ultimately failed to track down the perpetrators. On August the 7th, the bodies of McLeod and Schmigelski were found on a bank of the Nelson River, close to where a damaged rowboat had previously been discovered. They died from self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Number 2. Amelia Bambridge On October the 23rd of 2019, British backpacker Amelia Bambridge disappeared from a beach party on the island of Koh Rong, Cambodia. The island is a favorite among backpackers for its pristine beaches as well as for cheap guest houses and bars. It's believed that during the party, the 21-year-old had gone for a late-night swim. A massive search was mounted after Bambridge failed to check out from her hostel. 100 members of the local security forces scoured the sea and nearby jungle. More than a week later, Bambridge's body was found floated in the coastal waters northwest of Koh Rong, near the Thai border. Her death was ruled as accidental drowning and her remains were returned to her family. Number 1. Mia A. Liv Chung and Tom Jackson On August the 23rd of 2016, a mentally unstable French national fatally stabbed two backpackers who, like him, were staying at a hostel in Home Hill, Australia. 29-year-old Smail Ayad, who would later be diagnosed as suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, 
attacked and dragged his roommate, Nia A. Lif Chung, out of her bed. Armed with a large knife, he took the 21-year-old to a balcony and pressed the blade against her throat. The hostel manager and another guest pleaded with Ayad to drop the weapon, but he started violently slashing A. Lif Chung. The manager was stabbed in the leg as he tried to intervene. The young woman, staggering from her wounds, managed to reach a bathroom, and another guest called the authorities. Without thinking of his own safety, backpacker Tom Jackson, aged 30, ran upstairs and tended to A. Lif Chung's injuries. Unfortunately, she would succumb to them at the scene. Upon opening the bathroom door, Jackson was confronted by Ayed. He kicked the door open and then relentlessly started stabbing him in the head. Ayed then chased, caught, and killed the hostel's pet dog, Atari. Multiple police officers were injured as they struggled to subdue and restrain him. Five days after the attack, Jackson passed away from critical puncture wounds to his eye and brain. For his selflessness, in 2021, he was posthumously awarded the Star of Courage, Australia's highest bravery distinction. Ayed was charged with two counts of murder, one of animal cruelty, and multiple counts of assault in police. Ayed was subsequently found to have been unsound of mind at the moment of attack, as he believed there was an international conspiracy to kill him. He was remanded to Brisbane Mental Health Centre in Brisbane, where he was still awaiting expatriation to France as of 2020. Thanks for watching. Would you rather attempt to walk the world's longest route from the tip of South Africa to northern Russia or swim the entire length of the Amazon River? Let us know in the comments section below.